Once upon a time, there was a family called Pot. There was a father who'd been in the Royal Navy, Commander Correcticus Pot. Then there was a mother, Mimsy Pot, and a pair of eight-year-old twins, Jeremy, who was a black-haired boy, and Jemima, who was a golden-haired girl. And they lived in a wood beside a big lake with an island in the middle. Now, Commander Correcticus Pot was an explorer and an inventor, and I'm ashamed to say that because he was always dreaming of impossible inventions and adventures and explorations in the remotest parts of the Earth, he was generally known in the neighborhood as Commander Crackpot. <laughs> you may think it rude, and so it is. But Commander Pot was a humorous man, and he knew his own shortcomings very well. So when he heard that that was his nickname in the neighborhood, he was not at all cross. He just roared with laughter and said, oh, I'll show him, and disappeared into his workshop. Now, I don't know if you've got it into your heads yet, but the Pot family wasn't a very conventional family. That is, they were all rather out of the ordinary. Even Mimsy must have been rather an adventurous sort of mother, or she wouldn't have married an explorer and inventor like Commander Caractacus Pot, Royal Navy, retired, who had, as they say, no visible means of support, meaning he was someone who doesn't do regular work that brings in regular money, but depends on an occasional windfall from lucky explorations or inventions. So, when it came to buying a car, they were all determined it shouldn't be just any car, but something a bit different from everyone else's. Not one of those Black Beetle sedans that look much the same back and front, so that in the distance you don't know if it's coming or going, but something rather special, something rather adventurous. Well, they hunted all that afternoon and all the next day. They looked at brand new cars and they visited second-hand showrooms and then at the end of the second day, they came to a broken down little garage run by a once famous racing driver. He was the sort of enthusiast Commander Pot always had a warm corner in his heart for. Commander Pot followed the garage man round to the back of his shed, where there was a long, low object hidden under a tarpaulin. The garage man looked Commander Pot and the family carefully up and down, and then went to one end of the tarpaulin and slowly rolled it back. Well, there she is, he said sadly. She once knew every racing track in Europe. In the old days, there wasn't a famous driver in Britain who hadn't driven her at some time or other. She's still wearing England's racing green, as you can see. That was from the early 30s. She's a 12-cylinder, 8-litre, supercharged Paragon Panther. They only made one of them. And then the firm went broke. This is the only one in the world. Doesn't look like much, does she? I'm afraid she's due for the scrap heap. Commander Pot was looking curiously excited. <laughs> I said, do you mind if I look her over? Go ahead. She'd appreciate a last look over by someone like you, who knows what real quality used to be. The whole family picked their way over and through the patches of oily ground. And while Commander Pot looked under the hood, Mimsy and Jeremy and Jemima prodded the once beautiful soft leather upholstery. Moths flew out and looked under the carpets. Beetles scuttled about and examined the knobs and switches and dials on the dashboard. There were dozens of them, all rusty and mildewed, and tried the old boa constrictor horn that worked with an injured rubber bulb. 
But nothing happened. Oh, except that a lot of dust blew out into Commander Pop's face as he bent over the engine, peering and tinkering. The children looked at Mimsy, and Mimsy looked back at them. And do you know what? They all had the same look in their eyes, the look that said, this must once have been the most beautiful car in the world. And if the engine's more or less all right, and if we all set to and scrubbed and painted and mended and polished, do you suppose we could put her back as she used to be? It wouldn't be like having one of those black beetles that the factories turn out in hundreds and thousands that all look alike. We'd have a real jewel of a car, something to love and cherish and look after, as if it were one of the family. Commander Pot took his face out from under the hood. He looked at them, and they looked back at him. And he turned to the garage man and said, I'll buy her. We all love her. We'll make her as good as new. How much do you want for her? Fifty pounds, said the garage man. She wouldn't fetch much as scrap. Commander Pot counted out the notes there and then and said, <coughs> uh, uh, Thank you. And will you please have her towed along to my workshop just as soon as you can? Well, for three months, Commander Pot worked and worked secretly on the wreck of the old paragon. Smoke came out of the chimney, and often lights shone all night through the windows, and mysterious packages arrived from engineering factories all over England and disappeared into the workshop. Then at last came the great day when the whole family assembled outside the workshop while Commander Pot solemnly unlocked the doors, and they all trooped in to where the 12-cylinder, 8-litre, supercharged Paragon Panther stood under the bright lights. Mimsy and Jeremy and Jemima stood and stared and stared and stared until Jemima broke the silence and said, Oh, she's the most beautiful car in the world. Mimsy and Jeremy just nodded their agreement and looked at the paragon with round and shining eyes. And she was beautiful. Every single little thing had been put right. Every detail gleamed and glinted with new paint and polished chrome, right down to the snarling mouth of the big boar constrictor horn. Slowly, they walked around her, and examined her inch by inch, from the rows and rows of gleaming knobs on the dashboard to the brand new dark red leather upholstery, from the cream-colored collapsible roof to the fine new tires, from the glistening silver of the huge exhaust pipes to the glittering license plates. And then, silently, they climbed in through the low doors that opened and shut with the most delicious clicks. And Commander Pot sat behind the huge steering wheel with Mimsy beside him in her own bucket seat with an armrest. And Jeremy and Jemima got in the back and sank down in the big soft red leather cushions and rested their arms on their own armrests. Then, without saying anything, Commander Pot leaned forward and pressed the big black knob of the self-starter. Nothing happened. There was just the soft grinding from the starter motor. Jeremy and Jemima looked at each other with round eyes. Oh, uh, wasn't she going to work after all? But then Commander Pot pulled out the silver knob of the choke to feed more gas into the carburetor and pressed the starter again. And out of the exhaust pipe, there came these four noises. Chitty, chitty, 
Ricky Bang Bang. And then, silence. Again, Jeremy and Jemima looked at each other, now really rather worried. Had something gone wrong? But Commander Pot just said, mm, she's a bit cold. And he pressed the starter again. And this time, after the first two ch -ch 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 sneezes and the two soft bang bangs, the bangs ran on into each other so as to make a delicious purring rumble such as neither Mimsy nor Jeremy nor Jemima had ever heard before from a piece of machinery. Commander Pop put the big car into gear and slowly they rumbled and roared out of the workshop into the sunshine and up the lane to the highway. When they got to the side road that joined the highway, Commander Pot pressed the big bulb of the boar constrictor horn and let out a deep, polite, but rather threatening roar. And then, because he wanted to show everything to the children, Commander Pot pressed the electric horn button in the middle of the wheel, and the klaxon horn fired off with a terrific blast of warning. Ka -go -ga! Then she steered out onto the highway, and they were off, off on their first practice run. Well, I can only tell you that the huge, long, gleaming green car almost flew. With a click of the big central gear lever, Commander Pot got out of first gear into second at 40 miles an hour. Then another click at 70 miles an hour, and he was in third. And as they touched 100 miles an hour, he put the car into top gear, and there they were, passing the Black Beetle cars almost as if they were standing still. Ga go ga went the klaxon again and again as they swept down the big double lane highway. The drivers of the little family sedans looked in their rear mirrors and saw the great gleaming monster whistling towards them and drew to the side to let her go by. And when at last Commander Potts switched off the engine, it gave one last Chitty, chitty, <sighs> and was silent. They all climbed out, and Commander Pot turned to them with a gleam of triumph in his eye and said, Well, <laughs> what do you think of her? And Mimsy said, mm, Terrific. And Jeremy said, Smashing. And Jemima said, Adorable. And Commander Caractacus Pot said mysteriously, Well, that's good, but I'm warning you there's something odd about this car. I've put all I know into her, every invention, improvement I could think of, but there's more to it than that. <laughs> She's got some ideas of her own. What do you mean, they all chorused. Well, said Commander Pot carefully, I can't say why, but uh, <laughs> sometimes in the morning when I came back to get to work again, I'd find that certain modifications, certain changes had, so to speak, taken place all by themselves during the night when I wasn't there. Certain, what shall I say, rather revolutionary and extraordinary adaptations. I can't say more than that, because <laughs> uh, I really haven't got to the bottom of it all. But I suspect this motor car has thought it out all by herself. Certain improvements, certain very extraordinary mechanical devices, just as if she had a mind of her own. Just as if she were grateful to us for saving her life, so to speak, and wanted to repay all the loving care we'd given her. And there is another thing. See all those rows and rows of knobs and buttons and levers and little lights on the dashboard? Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't been able to discover what they're all for. Well, I know the obvious ones, of course, but there are some of those gadgets that seem to be secret gadgets. We'll find out in time, I suppose, what they're for, but for now I admit 
There are quite a lot of them that have got me really puzzled. She just won't let me find out. Jeremy said excitedly, We've got to have a name for her, and I know what we ought to call her, what she called herself. What do you mean? What was that? When did she, they all cried together. And Jeremy said slowly, She said it when she started. Chitty chitty, like sneezes, and then bang bang. So we'll call her that, her own invented name. The next day was Saturday, and the month was August, and the sun positively streamed down. It was a roaster of a day, and at breakfast, Commander Pot made an announcement. <coughs> Today, he said, is uh, going to be a roaster, a sculpture, and there's only one thing to do, and that's for us to take a delicious picnic, climb into Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and dash off down the Dover Road to the sea. So they all piled into the car, with the top down, of course, and with Chitty Chitty Bang Bang's usual Chitty Chitties and Bang Bang's, they were off down the lane to the highway that led to Dover and to the sea, some 20 miles away. But, 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 and once again, but, 22,650. Four other motor cars full of families had also decided to drive down the Dover Road to the sea on that beautiful Saturday morning. And there was an endless stream of cars going the same way as the Pot family in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Well, Commander Pot drove as cleverly as he could, overtaking when it was safe, weaving like a snake in and out the traffic, taking shortcuts and side roads to dodge really bad lines of cars. But they made terribly slow progress, in spite of much polite mooing of the boar constrictor horn. And I'm sorry to say, <laughs> an occasional furious gah, 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 on the klaxon when some booby in a black beetle insisted on hogging it down the middle of the road and not leaving room for Chitty Chitty Bang Bang to get by. All of them were getting more and more hot, and more and more impatient, and even Chitty Chitty Bang Bang began steaming angrily out of the top of her radiator, on which, oh, I'd forgotten to tell you about this, there was a silver mascot of a small aeroplane whose propeller went round and round in the wind, faster or slower, according to their speed. But all the same, they were making steady, though very slow progress, until they came on a solid jam of cars that must have reached for at least a mile, and there they were, there they were, stuck at the back of the line. Suddenly, Commander Pot happened to glance at the dashboard, and he said excitedly, I say, all of you, look at that. Mimsy looked, and Jeremy and Jemina peered over the back of the seat, and among all the knobs and instruments, a light on top of a small knob was flashing pale pink, and it was showing a word, and the word said, pull. Good heavens, said Commander Pot. I wonder what that knob was for, but it's one of the ones I haven't had time to tinker with. <laughs> what can it be for? Look, said Mimsy, the light's turning red. And sure enough, it was. And now another word was showing. And do you know what that other word said? It said, idiot. So now the angry red knob read, Pull, idiot. And Commander Pot laughed out loud and said, Oh, well, I never. Oh, that's pretty saucy. There's Chitty Chitty Bang Bang taking control and calling me an idiot into the bargain. Oh, 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 oh. oh well, here goes. And he reached over and pulled down the little silver lever. The children, in fact, the whole family, sat on the edge of their seats and waited excitedly to see what would happen. And then a kind of soft humming noise began. It seemed to come from all over the car, from the front axle, from the back axle, from underneath the hood. 
And then the most extraordinary transmogrifications, which is just a long word for changes, began to occur. The big mud guards swiveled outwards, so they stuck out like wings. And then on the dashboard, besides another little lever, a green light started to blink. And this light said, pull down. And Commander Pot, rather nervously, but this time obediently, reached over and gingerly pulled the lever very, very slowly down. And then, what do you think happened? Yes, you're absolutely right. The wings slowly tilted, and Commander Pot, at last realizing what Chitty Chitty Bang Bang was up to, pressed down the accelerator pedal, and the big green car, which was now what I might call an, an aero car, tilted up her shining green and silver nose and took off. Yes, she took off like an aeroplane and soared up over the car in front, just missing its roof, and roared away over the long line of stationary cars in the line, while all the people stared out of their car windows in absolute astonishment. And Commander Pot called out, Hang on, everybody! Oh, for heaven's sake, hang on! Mimsy, Jeremy and Jemima clutched the armrests beside them and sat stiff with excitement, with their eyes and mouths wide open, thinking, Heaven's above! What is going to happen next? Well, what happened next was there came a shrill whine of machinery and a thump, 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 thump from under the car, and automatically the four wheels retracted up into the body so as to be out of the way and let the aero car go faster without the wind resistance of the wheels to slow her down. Commander Pot sat gripping the wheel and chuckling with excitement and delight. I told you so! I told you so! He shouted against the roar of the wind. She's got high dance of her own. Oh, yes! She's a magical car. Don't worry, she'll look after us. Over the solid line of cars, they flew. Altitude 500 feet, airspeed 100 miles per hour, engine temperature 120 degrees, revolutions of propeller 3,000 per minute, visibility 5 miles. And of course, at that speed, in minutes, they were over the coast. Then, a curious thing happened. The steering wheel twisted. It actually twisted in Commander Pot's hands as if Chitty Chitty Bang Bang realized their disappointment and was taking control herself. And you know what? Chitty Chitty Bang Bang turned away from the coast and soared away over the English Channel straight out to sea. The family held their breath with excitement, and Commander Pot wrestled with the wheel and began to look rather nervous. But then the green light started to blink on the dashboard, and now, instead of saying pull down, as it said before, it said push up. And gently, Commander Pot pushed the little silver lever, and gently, chitty, chitty, bang, bang, began to lose height and plane softly downwards. Heaven, said Mimsy, she's going to drop us in the sea. Now we really are in a mess. Get ready to swim, everyone. The cushions will float. Each one hang on to a cushion. Oh, don't worry, Mimsy, darling, shouted Commander Pot against the roar of the wind. It'll be all right. I think I know what Chitty Chitty Bang Bang has got in mind. Look there, where we're heading for. Those are the Goodwin Sands. Acres of beautiful sands that get uncovered during low tide. While Commander Pot was talking, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang had been gently planing downwards towards the big expanse of beautiful golden sands lapped by the soft blue ripples of the English Channel. Commander Pot gently took his foot off the accelerator. The wheels automatically lowered themselves into position again and they came to land on the hard, flat, golden surface. 
The aero car ran a little way on the sand, and then, as Commander Pot put on the brakes, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang came to a gentle stop at the edge of the sea. At once, the red light on the dashboard showed again, and now it said, Push up. No idiot this time. Commander Pot pushed up the little silver lever, and there came the same low hum as the front and back wings slowly folded back to become mudguards again, and the big propeller and generator out front slipped back until the two halves of the radiator closed over them. Chitty, chitty, bang, bang, gave a last two big sneezes and two soft bangs, and then Commander Pot switched off the engine, and there, was a perfectly good, gleaming green car sitting quietly on a huge sandbank in the middle of the sea. The whole family let out a big whoo of relief and excitement and piled out of the magical car onto the warm sand. After they had all swum about like dolphins, they all lay down in the sunshine, drowsy and full of good things and really quite exhausted with all the excitements of the day, and one by one they doze off for a little rest. Oh. But, but, but no one noticed that the tide was creeping in over the sands. No one, no, 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 not one of the dozing family noticed that the wheels of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang were slowly inch by inch being submerged by the incoming tide. And no one realized that soon, very, very soon, the whole family, Commander Pot, Mimsy, Jeremy, and Jemima, and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, who's now really a member of the family too, would be marooned out in the middle of the sea, threatened with mortal danger. It was Chitty Chitty Bang Bang who first woke up to the danger. As the sea came creeping up, the water gradually submerged the wheels of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And when it reached the bottom of her radiator, she let out a loud warning hiss from the hot metal. The family opened dozy eyes and then all at once they were on their feet and Commander Pop was running to the car. He jumped in, but already the first little waves had run up the flat sand after them and the bottoms of the tires were awash. My goodness, said Commander Pot. Now we've had it. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang can never get enough speed to take off through the water. Suddenly, among the many dials and buttons and levers on the dashboard, a violet light began to blink urgently, showing the words, Turn the knob! And quickly, although Commander Pot didn't know the secret of every one of the rows of gadgets on the dashboard, he turned the knob under the violet light, and from underneath the car there came a soft grinding of cogwheels and a curious lifting and shifting of the chassis so that the whole family peered out over the side to see what was happening. And do you know what? Oh, I bet you can't guess. All four wheels, pointing fore and aft, as all car wheels do, had turned and had now flattened out like a hovercraft. Well, being an inventor, Commander Pot realized what this meant and what the result would be. So he pressed slowly on the accelerator, and just as the waves came up level with the floorboards, all four wheels began to turn like propellers. There was a jerk, and chitty, chitty, bang, bang began to move through the water, just like a motorboat with the four wheels whizzing round and round, propelling her forward. Well, that was all very fine, but she was a heavy car with four people in her. And the only way to keep from sinking was to go so fast that they were almost skimming over the surface. So Commander Pot trod the accelerator into the floorboards. There was a great whirl of spray from the four wheels, 
And chitty, chitty, bang, bang, fairly sped across the surface of the sea, kicking up waves like a speedboat. They had all let out a great, oh, of relief when Jeremy, who had a great sense of direction, said, Daddy, aren't we pointing the wrong way? Well, said Commander Potch, uh, it's, it's the holidays, isn't it? Yes, they all chorus. So uh, we'd like to have a holiday adventure, right? Yes, they said breathlessly. Well, said Commander Potch, Chitty, chitty, bang, bang is going like smoke. The channel is as flat as a mill pond. We've got plenty of gas and the oil pressure's fine. The engine temperature's all right. And the fog will lift the further we get away from land. And it can't be more than about oh, 25 miles now to the other side of the channel. And we are doing about... We are doing about... 30 knots, and a naval knot is 1.15 miles per hour, which gives us, let me see, a speed of about 35 miles per hour. So, oh, the whole trip, it'll take less than an hour, and it's only five o'clock now. He paused for breath. And we've never been abroad. I thought it would be rather fun to go to France. Good heaven, said Mimsy. Gosh, said Jemima. My hat, said Jeremy. And for a moment, they all sat thinking about this colossal adventure. And then Mimsy said, but we haven't got any passports. And Jeremy said, but don't they have different money in France? Franks, they're called. What about Franks? And Jemima said, what about the language? I've only learned we, oui, which means yes, and non, which means no, and that's not going to get me very far. Commander Pot said firmly, oh, that's no way to treat adventures. Never say no to adventures. Always say yes. Otherwise, you'll lead a very dull life. Now, the, the passports, uh, we'll make for Calais, which is dead ahead, and go to the British Consul, who represents all English people, from the Queen down. And in Calais, we'll get provisional passports. As for money, we, we've got pounds, and, well, we'll change them into francs. Language. Mimsy and I both talk French a bit, and if we can't make ourselves understood, we'll find someone who talks English. More people in the world talk English than any other language, and we'll soon find someone, right? Then that's settled. They sped happily on, getting nearer and nearer to France, and then the water got shallower and shallower until they touched the beach and the violet light on the dashboard blinked urgently and said, Turn the knob. When Commander Pot turned the knob, the wheel straightened out and clicked back into the straightforward position, and they bumped and churned their way up onto the beach. Round a big headland, tucked right in under a cliff so that you couldn't see it from seaward, was the mouth of a cave. This is perfect, said Commander Pot. <laughs> and he switched on the big headlights. Excitedly, they all peered forward into the cave and it seemed to widen out as it burrowed into the cliff until it came to well, what looked like a corner. And now the cave opened out and became still bigger. And there were marks of pickaxes or chisels of some kind on the walls. And that meant that humans had been at work making the cave broader. And there was a straight piece. And then another corner. And then another. Now they were very far from the entrance and deep, deep inside the cliff. And they wondered, all of them, rather anxiously what they would find as chitty, chitty, bang, bang, 
nosed carefully round the bend. I must admit that what they found gave them such a shock that even Chitty Chitty Bang Bang's exhaust gave a kind of trembly gulp. And Commander Pot himself, who was a very brave man, gave quite a jump in the driving seat and at once put on the brakes, switched off the engine, so there was dead silence in the depths of the cave. As for Mimsy, Jeremy and Jemima, to be quite honest, they went all goose-pimply with fright and just stared and stared at the dreadful thing in front of them. It was a skeleton, a human skeleton that hung down from the ceiling and swayed softly in the breeze that blew through the cave. It was probably only seconds, but it seemed like minutes that they sat and just stared and stared, and the empty eye holes in the skull stared back at them, and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang's big lights showed up each separate bone and the rope that hung down from the roof of the cave and was tied tightly around the skeleton's neck. Commander Pot spoke first, and it was good to hear his strong human voice say, Oh, this is ridiculous. It's nothing but a scarecrow. There are secrets in this cave that someone wants to keep secret and frighten people away. Oh, I, 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 I vote for going on. What do you all say? Mimsy said doubtfully, If you think it's all right, darling. And Jemima said in a rather trembly voice, <laughs> After all, it's only a lot of old bones. And Jeremy said, pretending to forget all about the skeleton, would be an awful bore to have to reverse the whole way back. Besides, it'll be jolly exciting to find out the secret of the cave. And Commander Potts said, That's the spirit, which wasn't a very good choice of words with the ghostly skeleton swaying in front of them. So they went on. And then, round a particularly sharp bend, they were suddenly faced with a blank wall of chalk that completely closed the cave. They had come to the end. Or at any rate, they seemed to have come to the end of the long cave. But Commander Pot got out of the car and walked forward, looking at the ground and the walls and examining them inch by inch. And he seemed to find something that excited him very much. He came back to the car and announced, It's not a wall. <laughs> it's uh, <clears throat> some kind of a door, a sort of secret trap door. We must find the catch that opens it. Come on, everyone. So inch by inch, the family, working in the bright glare from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang's headlights, began examining what seemed to be a solid wall of chalk blocking the cave. And all at once, Jemima gave a squawk of excitement and called, Daddy, come quickly. And when Commander Pot knelt down beside her, he saw what she had seen, an electric light switch. So he pressed down the switch. From somewhere inside the walls of the cave, there came a deep rumbling and a grinding of machinery as very slowly the jagged zigzag crack in the solid wall widened and widened and widened until the two halves of what was really a secret door slid sideways into deep slots in the side walls of the cave. And... What do you think Chitty Chitty Bang Bang's lights showed through the opening? A huge vaulted room, and all round the sides were cases and boxes and barrels and sacks neatly stacked up against the walls. It was an underground warehouse. Mimsy, who was like all mothers, worried about the children, said at once, Darling, Let's close the secret door again and reverse quietly back down the way we came. 
I don't like the look of this at all. I wouldn't be at all surprised if we hadn't come upon a nest of crooks and gangsters. I only hope none of them appear while we're looking into their secret hoard. Oh, well, said Commander Puff cheerfully. We have to take the rough with the smooth, eh? You'll never get real adventures without a bit of risk somewhere. Oh, come on. And they all piled back into Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and crept up the last bit of slope until they were parked slap in the middle of the huge secret vault. They all began to pry and peer into the secret stocks that were piled up round the walls of the big echoing vault. Jeremy was first. Machine guns! he cried excitedly. Mimsy said, Oh heavens, boxes and boxes of bombs and hand grenades. Dagger said Jemima, all kinds of them, and bayonets with rifles to go with them. Well, I'm dashed, said Commander Pot. Dynamite in these cases, and yards and yards of fuse, and jelly ignite. The stuff burglars used to blast open safes and vaults. Revolvers, call out Jeremy. Pistols, big ones and small ones of every kind, with boxes and boxes of cartridges. Mimsy called out anxiously, Now don't touch anything, children. You may look, but you are not to touch. Something might go off. Commander Pot had a scruffy bit of paper in his hand, and he said, oh, I say, I say, I, do you know what I think all this stuff is for? In one of the boxes, there was this scrap of paper that says, Special order for Joe the Monster, 453 Basher Street, Soho, London, W2. Now, he's the man I read about from time to time as being responsible for the bank robberies and the hold-ups in England that the papers are always full of. But uh, the police have never been able to catch him, and they've never even been able to find out where he gets his weapons from. Well, there's no doubt about it. This is his secret arms dump. Commander Pot scratched his head. Now, what do we do next? I know, I know, I, I know, Jeremy cried excitedly. We blow it all up. Well, <laughs> said Commander Pot thoughtfully, it would be rather fun, uh, yes, wouldn't it? But, I mean, first of all, we've got to find the way out of here. Then I, I'll run back and lay a fuse down the cave to the dynamite and we'll all get as far away as possible before the fireworks display. Outside the vault, Commander Pot stopped the car and went back. He took a long roll of fuse out of one of the boxes and he attached one end to the stacks of dynamite and pulled all the gel ignite on top of the dynamite. And then he unrolled the length of fuse and came back to the car, after blocking up the entrance again with big crates so the explosion, when it came, wouldn't chase them up the cave. Then he gave Jeremy the big roll of fuse to unwind as they went along. And off went chitty chitty bang bang up the sloping cave towards the distant glimmer of light that was in the entrance. It was getting dusk by now, and far away across the fields, they could see the side lights of a car that seemed to be coming towards them along the same car track as they were on. Oh, I, I, I expected some farmer, said Commander Pot. Come on, we'd better light the fuse and get away quick. Commander Pot got out of the car took the rest of the roll of fuse from Jeremy, cut the end, and threw the rest of the coil into the back of the car. Then he knelt down and put a match to the end of the fuse and dived for the driver's seat and got chitty, chitty, bang, bang, quickly away from the danger area. Almost at once there came a deep rumbling roar from right down inside the cliff. The ground shook. A great yellow jet of flame shot out of the quarry they had just left. And from the edge of the cliff, 
there came a distant flash and a deep boom. Then came a series of smaller underground explosions and crackles as the ammunition boxes blew up one by one and the bombs and the cartridges caught fire. And then there was one last terrific roar and whoosh of flame. And then silence. They all let their breath out. Whoosh! By golly, Jemima. Gee whiz, Jeremy. Well, I never, Mimsy. Commander Potts said, Oh, that's the biggest bang I've ever heard. Now, come on, we'd better get away quick from here before we have to do any explaining. There's that farmer's car still coming, and people will have heard that bang as far away as Calais. Oh, they'll even have heard it right across the channel in England. As they approached what they thought had been a farmer's car, they saw it was a big, black, open tourer, a very powerful-looking car indeed, and it had drawn itself right across the track so as not to let them pass. Commander Pop whispered, I, uh, I, uh, I regret to uh, have to announce that uh, that Joe the Monster. I've seen pictures of him outside the police station, and the other two, they're his gang. Man Mountain Fink, who's escaped from heaven knows how many prisons. He must be on the run now. And Soapy Sam, he's their explosive expert for opening safes. Soapy's the crook's name for jelly night. Watch out, kids. Watch out. This is going to be tricky. As Joe the Monster drew level with the car, Commander Pop pulled the lever sharply down and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang's big green mudguards swung sharply out into their wing shape. The right-hand wing caught Joe the monster slap in his tummy and sent him flying head over heels. Hang on, shouted Commander Pop, and keep your heads down. He rammed the accelerator down into the floorboards. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang leaped forward with an angry roar from her twin exhausts and swooped low at the three gangsters who had just time to throw themselves down on their faces. And then the great green aero car, for that's what she had become, just cleared the top of the gangster's car and roared off into the main road. They got to the main road to Calais and drew up in front of a very nice-looking hotel called the Splendide which uh, is, as you may have guessed, French for splendid. Commander Pot filled the car up with gas and oil and water. He checked the batteries and the tires and drove the car into a comfortable garage beside the hotel. Then he patted her on her rather hot nose and locked her up for the night. And then he went back into the hotel where the whole family sat down to their delicious dinner before going up to bed for a wonderful, and I'm sure you'll agree, well-earned rest. But, 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 and again, but. Later that night, when they were all fast asleep, a long black car with Joe the Monster at the wheel and Mound Mountain Fink and Soapy Sam, crouching down in the body of the car, came creeping up to the Hotel Splendide in the darkness and hid itself among the shadows down a side turning. When Joe the Monster had seen the lights go out in the hotel and had noticed from the shadows on the blind, the Commander Pot and Mimsy were sleeping in one room with Jeremy and Jemima in another room next door. He and his ruffians got swiftly to work. In a trice, the gang had run a ladder up the hotel wall to the room where Jeremy and Jemima lay fast asleep. While Man Mountain Fink held the foot of the ladder, Soapy Sam crept softly up it. He went first to Jemima's bed, whirled the four corners of the sheet on which she was lying, and almost before she could wake, 
he handed her softly out of the window and into the arms of Man Mountain Fink. Jeremy had stirred in his sleep, but here again it only needed a few quick movements and he too was on his way out of the window. And then their clothes and their shoes were hurled pell-mell after them. But of course the children were quickly awake. And even before they could be bundled into the back of the black car, they'd started to struggle and squeak. But alas, not loud enough. Mimsy woke up and said sleepily to Commander Pot, did you hear that squeaking? It sounded sort of muffled. I suppose it wasn't the children. But Commander Pot only gave a sleepy grunt and said, Well, I expect it was bats or mice. And went firmly off to sleep again. And neither of them paid any attention to the sound of the black car starting up and driving away. Fortunately... Chitty, chitty, bang, bang, had smelled trouble. Heaven knows how, but there it is. All through the night, while Commander Pot and Mimsy were asleep, and while the twins were being bumped about in the back of the gangster's car, Chitty, chitty, bang, bang's radar eye was following every twist and every turn of Joe the Monster hunched over the wheel of his black tourer, which was now hurtling up the great main road towards Paris. Joe the monster leaned back from the wheel and said over his shoulder in a voice that was meant to be sugary, Now then, duckies, everything's all right. Your dear pa and ma have asked us to take you for a little night drive to see something of the French countryside by moonlight. You just go off to bye-byes, and when you wakey-wakey, there'll be a delicious brekkie waiting for you. Now, if there's one thing the twins and most other children of their age hate, it's being talked to in baby language. I mean, at least you know where you are with grown-ups who behave like grown-ups. But no child likes a grown-up to talk like a baby. But... Truth to tell, both Jeremy and Jemima were terribly sleepy from the previous day's adventures, and Jemima was soon fast asleep. But before Jeremy dozed off, he heard snatches of conversation between Joe the Monster and Man Mountain Fink drifting back from the front seat. And the snatches of conversation were something... something like this. Yes. Yeah. Just what we want, eh, for the bonbon job? Innocent pair of monkeys, shove them in just before closing. Five thousand francs. The keys of the safe are in the till. When the old geezer goes for the chain, then Soapy can use the jelly. Huh. <laughs> it was eight o'clock when the gangster's car drew up outside a deserted warehouse in Paris. Precisely at this moment, when the gangsters were carrying out the bundled-up children into the building, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang began to go, ga go ga ga go ga ga go ga and just went on doing it. Commander Pot and Mimsy were instantly awake, and with, I'm sorry to say, a very powerful swear word, uh, it was... Dash my wig and whiskers, if you want to know. Commander Pot leaped out of his bed, pulled on some clothes, dashed downstairs and round to the garage to find out what the electrical fault was and to stop it. But when he caught sight of the little thin radar antenna sticking up in front of the windshield, he stopped in his tracks. What in heaven's name? He had just begun. When Mimsy came dashing over from the hotel... The children, she cried desperately. They've gone, and they're closed too. They've been kidnapped, they've been kidnapped. I know it. Commander Pot didn't argue or say, Are you sure? How do you know? Or even go to see the evidence for himself. He knew that Jeremy and Jemima would never have left the hotel of their own accord. And certainly not, he added to himself, without having had any breakfast. Suddenly he knew... He knew absolutely for sure what was the meaning of the radar device and that the magical car 
had sounded her horn both to wake them up and because she knew where the twins had gone. Commander Pot jumped into the driving seat and Mimsy jumped in beside him and they were off. Meanwhile, at the gangster's hideout, Jeremy and Jemima's clothes had been thrown in with them and now they dressed very quickly. Then the door was unlocked and Joe the monster himself came in. Now then, he said, just you both listen to me. And if you do what you're told, you'll come to no harm. You'll even earn yourselves a bit of money into the bargain. And when it's over, I'll see you're both put on a train and sent back to your precious dad and mum in that hotel in Calais. Jeremy opened his mouth to speak, but Joe the monster held up a big hairy fist. Don't you argue with me, young'un. All I'm telling you both to do is to go and buy yourselves a big box of chocolates. Now, how would you like that? Not far away from here, 20 minutes ride, is the most famous chocolate shop in the world. It's called Le Bon Bon, which in case you don't know it, is French for candy. And it's run by an old geezer called Monsieur Bon Bon. Now, this old geezer's a funny old guy, and he only opens up his shop for four hours in the middle of the day. He can't be bothered to keep it open no longer, so he keeps it open from 10 till 12 in the morning and from 2 till 4 in the afternoon. At 12 o'clock this morning, me and my pals are going to drive you round there and give you a pocket full of money. And all you got to do is to do what I tell you. You walk into the shop and ask for a box of chocolates, costing 4,000 francs. You can see it's going to be a fine box of chocolates, eh? And he looked inquiringly from one to the other. Mm, not bad, said Jeremy. Not bad, he says, shouted Joe the monster angrily. I'll say it's not bad. It's the biggest box of chocolates either of you have ever seen. He quickly calmed down, fished out a pocketbook stuffed with notes, took out one and handed it to Jeremy. There you are, 5,000 francs. And I'll tell you what, I'll even let you keep the change. So there, duckies. Ta-da, kids, and be good until Uncle Joe comes and fetches you. He walked out, followed by Soapy Sam, who locked the door behind them. Then Jeremy and Jemima whispered their thoughts and fears about Joe the Monster's plans, and with the help of snatches of conversation Jeremy had heard in the car, they came to the following conclusion, which, since it's more or less right, I will pass on to you. They guessed that they were going to be used by Joe the Monster and his gang to rob Monsieur Bonbon. Jeremy had been given a 5,000 franc note to buy a 4,000 franc box of chocolates and Monsieur Bonbon would have to go to the till to change it. Now, as soon as Monsieur Bonbon opened the till, the gangsters would dash in, knock him on the head, and seize the keys of the safe where he kept his money. When we go up to the counters to buy the chocolates, said Jeremy, we've got somehow to warn Monsieur Bonbon that there are gangsters outside. I know. We'll write him some sort of note but we haven't got any pens or pencils or even paper. We've got the paper, said Jeremy triumphantly, and he produced the big 5,000 franc note and spread it out between them. We can use the sharp tip of the corkscrew on my pocket knife and punch holes in the bank note to spell out the word gangsters in big letters. Come on, let's get going quickly. Jeremy had only just stowed the note and his knife away in his pocket when the door opened 
and Joe the monster came in. Come on, duckies, time to go, he said. They piled into the black tourer and were soon roaring through the streets. The doors of Monsieur Bonbon's brilliantly lit shop were just closing as they dashed up, and they had no chance to examine the row upon row of delicious candies and chocolates temptingly arrayed in the long window. Monsieur Bonbon beamed down at the two children and let the door stand open. Qu'est-ce que vous désirez? And from the lift of his eyebrows, the children guessed that he was saying, What do you desire? Jeremy managed to stammer out, A, a bo box of chocolates, please, for 4,000 francs, and held out with, I admit, a rather trembling hand, the 5,000 franc note. Monsieur Bonbon took the note, and as the children expected, he at once opened it up, felt the holes in it. Gangsters, whispered Jeremy. Gangsters, outside. And he jerked his head towards the door. Monsieur Bonbon was suddenly transformed from a delightful old Father Christmas into a man of action. Without a word, he ran, surprisingly quickly for an old man, across the shop to the door, bolted and barred it, and then he pressed quickly down on a lever beside the door, and the steel shutters of the shop rattled down inside. Then Monsieur Bonbon darted back behind the counter, picked up the telephone, excitingly shouted a lot of French down it, among which Jeremy and Jemima heard the word police used several times. Then Monsieur Bonbon put the receiver back on the hook and came round and stood looking down at the children for a minute or two. Then he said, And now, mes enfants, tell me what this is all about, yes? But as Jeremy began to stammer out his story, from the outside street came the familiar warning blare of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Ga go ga, ga go ga, ga go ga. And then a splintering crash of glass and metal and the sound of shouts and people running. And what had happened was this. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang had broken all records in her dash to Paris. Commander Pot clung grimly to the wheel, and Mimsy spent most of the time with her hands over her eyes, as if at any moment they would crash. But then the little radar scanner on the hood held steadily along one particular stretch of street, and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang slowed down all by herself as if she were sniffing about looking for something. And sure enough, as they passed a big candy store with the words bonbon in gold on it, a long, low, black car dashed suddenly out of a side street. Chitty, chitty, bang, bang, hit the black tourer, bang, in the middle, with a tremendous crash and a tinkling of glass, and knocked it right over on its side, spilling Joe the monster and Soapy Sam out onto the road. And just as that moment, as the gangsters scrambled to their feet to make a run for it, French motorcycle patrols with sirens screaming appeared from both ends of the street and tore down upon them. And then, with the three gangsters lined up and covered with the policemen's revolvers, the door of the candy shop opened, and the little man, looking rather like Father Christmas, came running out, followed by Jeremy and Jemima. Well, well, you can imagine. Oh, the scenes of happiness and excitement that followed as the twins were reunited with their parents. Everything was explained to the police in a mixture of English and French, and many, many compliments were piled on the shy heads of Jeremy and Jemima for the gallant part they had played in bringing about the capture of the gangsters. Then Monsieur Bonbon beckoned Jeremy and Jemima back into the shop and told them to hold out their arms and pile box after box of wonderful candy and chocolates onto them until the twins could hardly stand upright. 
And since the piles of boxes grew higher than their faces, they could hardly see their way out of the door, and they had to be helped as they staggered out to pack their scrumptious presents into the back of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Then there were affectionate farewells all round, and they all promised to keep in touch and visit each other whenever they had the chance. And then Chitty Chitty Bang Bang went motoring gently off down the street. Commander Potts said, oh, I, uh, I think that's quite enough adventure for the time being. <laughs> it's high time we all went home to peace and quiet. And Mimsy said very forcibly, I entirely agree. But in the back, Jeremy and Jemima both gave a squat of protest. Oh, no, they cried more or less together, more adventure, more, more. And at that, believe it or not, there came a whirring of machinery from somewhere deep down inside Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. The front and back mudguards swiveled out into wings, the radiator opened up, and the whizzing propeller of the cooling fan slid out, and with a tremendous <laughs> The great green car soared up into the sky. My hat, shouted Commander Pot, which was the right thing to shout, as his hat had, in fact, been blown off. I, uh, <laughs> I can't control her. She's taken off. Where in heaven is she taking us? And, to tell you the truth, even I haven't been let into the secret.